Many people believe that the Plains Indian teepee is absolutely the finest of all movable shelters. To the Native American whose concept of life and religion was broader, deeper, richer and infinitely more unified than that of his conqueror the teepee was much more, both home and church, a sacred place of being and sharing with family, friends, nature and man above. Unfortunately, settlers found the all-encompassing Native American way literally, beyond understanding, and, therefore, of no consequence. This high-handed and naive judgment extended, of course, to the lodges of the tribes. In the either-or settler's mind, the teepee was flimsy and primitive when compared to a solid, substantial frame building. The fact that a teepee was bright, open, airy, warm, dry and easily transported over all outdoors while the frame structure was and largely remains closed in, dark, poorly ventilated and rather pathetically rooted to one spot was completely beside the point to this schizoid way of thinking. Luckily, our, civilized, appraisal of the Native American way is now going through some changes in that more reverent lifestyle is increasingly understood and embraced by the new gentle people. As one result of this trend, the teepee is enjoying a sudden popularity. The teepee is not the final answer for everyone, of course, but it remains time, money and labor versus comfort, utility and versatility probably the world's most efficient shelter. If you've ever wanted one, here's how to make it happen. Building a tepee. For this type and size of tepee, follow the material LST given in the example. Indian tipis varied from slightly less than 10 feet in diameter, for hunting expeditions, to permanent lodges with a diameter of more than 30 feet. The larger structures naturally required more and longer poles than the smaller ones. We've compromised on a tent diameter of approximately 18-1-2 feet and you'll need 17 poles about 25 feet long. The 15 poles used in the frame should be 3 or 4 inches thick at the butt and 2 inches through where they cross and tie. The two smoke flap poles need be no thicker than 2 inches at the butt. The best poles always come from a young, crowded stand where each tree has grown tall and slim reaching for the sun. Red and white cedar make exceptionally light, strong supports which were prized by some tribes. Lodge pale pine and western yellow pine are both heavier but still make good teepee supports. If none of these are available, use the best timber you can find for the job. If you do find some suitable timber, cut the trees early in the spring and trim off all knots and branches up the tree with an axe or chainsaw. Lay each pole across two sawhorses and, starting at the butt, straddle the pole and peel it with a sharp draw knife. Season the peeled poles by laying them flat across pieces of scrap lumber spaced two feet apart on a patch of open ground. Let the pores air and sun cure for three to four weeks. Turn them regularly so they season out straight and true. I recommend a good application of log oil or floor hardener to preserve and protect the finished poles. If you're on the non-chemical trip you may prefer to let the wood age naturally or compromise on a couple coats of linseed oil rubbed in. Selecting a tepee cover. A properly tanned hide teepee cover was a beautiful creamy white and you're going to want a white, pearl gray, yellow or other bright canvas for your cover. The colored canvas blue, green, brown and olive drab so dear to the hearts of most tent makers is not at all traditional and will make your finished teepee dark and dreary inside. The coated, modem, fabrics also shut out too much light and the lobins have found that muslin exposed directly to the sun has a short life. So a light-colored, lightweight canvas it is. If you can obtain an 8 or 10 ounce duck canvas in 72 foot width, you'll save some work and your tepee will have fewer seams. It's hard to find canvas that wide, so we're basing our design on a fabric of 36 foot width. 3. When all six strips are sewed together, lay the cover out flat again and locate the center of the upper strip. Measure down 20 inches from the top edge of this strip and out 8 1 2 feet both directions from its center line. Cut off and remove the 20 inches by approximately 10 3 4 foot rectangles from the two upper corners of the strip. Note that the cut made perpendicular to the edge of the canvas is extended to a depth of 24 inches even though the piece removed is only 20 inches deep. The extra 4 inches will later be turned under for a hem. 4. Sew the two removed panels into one strip. Center and attach this long narrow piece to the bottom of the 25 feet and 10 inch strip. 
This will extend the whole canvas enough to allow you to chalk and cut a 1914 foot radius from the center of the top edge of the teepee cover. 5. Set a peg at point X and swing your chalk on a length of cord that will not stretch. You can also drill a hole for the peg in a board or piece of plywood, drill a second hole for the chalk in another and nail the two sections to a 2 by 4 so that the holes are the proper distance apart. The selvage on tent canvas unlike the selvage on most other fabrics is not cut off and removed. This means that your 36 inch wide material is actually 37 inches wide. The pattern we are using was designed to give you the most teepee from the least material and if your six seams across the cover are one half to three quarters of an inch wide the 1914 foot radius will not run off the bottom edge of the piece together fabric. If the radius does run off the bottom, don't worry. Just cut another scrap and piece out the bottom center a little farther or pull in the string and make the radius 19 feet and 1 inch or 19 feet and 2 inches. You'll never notice the slight difference in final teepee size. 6. Directly below, X, on the first seam, measure 3 inches each way from the center line for the base of the tie flap. Cut from these points straight out to point X, trim and hem the resulting long, narrow triangle 6 by 24 inches to a flap 6 inches wide by 8 inches long. The 4 inches allowed when the corner panels were removed from the top of the cover can be turned down and pinned while a half oval is cut from each side of what will become the teepee's front. The half ovals will later form the door of the shelter and each cut should finish out, after hemming, approximately 46 inches long by 10 inches deep and be located 12 inches in from the cover's outside radius. The 4 inches down each side of the teepee's front can be permanently turned and hemmed before or after the door halves are cut and finished out. If you are or can procure the services of a good seamstress, you may want to put a facing around the door ovals and then hem the front edges. When you do sew this hem, be sure to make it only 3 1 2 inches wide with the extra 1 2 inch turned under again so no raw edge is left exposed. 7. After the 3 1 2 inch hem is finished, lay out, cut and stitch in the lacing pin holes below the door opening and between the door and the base of the smoke flaps. The holes on the left side start 3 4 inch from the hemmed door and the two rows are spaced 1 1 2 inches apart with the outside row set 3 4 inch from the edge. Use the same edge distance for the holes on the right side, but space the two rows 2 inches apart. The 1 2 inch difference will make lacing pin insertion considerably easier and neater when the right side is lapped over the left. I recommend a vertical spacing of 7 inches between each set of holes although if you like a lot of tedious hand work you can space them as close as 4 inches. Note that it is not necessary to run the holes all the way to the base of the smoke flaps. Tie tapes, added later, will be better than lacing pins for closing that space. To make each hole, cut a little cross with quarter inch arms in the canvas and button stitch around it with number 10 unbleached shoemaker's thread coated with beeswax. If done properly, this will make a 3 8 inch diameter, self reinforced round hole and no grommets will be needed. 8. The top horizontal piecing seam is now open for 39 inches on each side of the 6 inches base of the tie flap. A gore of 39 by 39 by 7 inches finished size with 1 inch added all around for seams is sewed into each opening detail for a flat seams, again, are best and you'll probably prefer to sew in these gores by hand. 9. An 8 by 24 inch extension is now added to the base of each smoke flap. These 8 inch extensions are more authentically Cheyenne than Sioux. The Sioux only occasionally added extensions of no more than 4 inches. This slight deviation from a strictly Sioux pattern really helps to weather tight a teepee during heavy storms, however, and is a worthwhile addition. Again, allow for hemming the flaps and sewing them on with a flat seam. 11. Sew two tapes, each three feet long, to the tie flap and an 18-inch long tie tape to the base of each smoke flap. The tapes are made by folding together a 3-inch wide strip of canvas into a triple thick 1-inch wide band that is double stitched down both sides. Note that the tape on the base of the left smoke flap is sewed to the top side of the hem and the right smoke flap's tape is placed on the underside of the hem. This is not a mistake. When the cover is in position with the right side lapped over the left, the tapes will be properly positioned for easiest tying. 
12. Buttonhole Stitch a small hole in the lower corner of each smoke flap and attach a 3 16-inch cord 16 feet long. 13. As a final reinforcement, you can sew a length of 3 16-inch cord around the tie flap and along the top edge of the smoke flaps. Use the same shoemaker's thread you used for the buttonhole stitching and sew over and over. It is not necessary to hem the bottom of the tepi since the cloth cut on a bias will not ravel. This again is traditional as the Indians themselves seldom hem their tepi bottoms. Adding a tepi liner. The tepi cover is now complete but, if you were to stretch it over a set of poles and peg the bottom down, you'd find the resulting shelter no more comfortable than the average settler's tent. Wind would blow in at the bottom, rain run down the poles and drip on everyone and everything, smoke from an inside fire fill the structure under most conditions and moisture condense inside on every cool night. The tepi would be hot in summer, cold in winter, dirty, drafty and damp, in short, it would be unsuitable for camping and unfit to live in for extended periods just like most settlers' tents. One simple modification, the addition of a liner, changes all that. With a liner and a little common sense, the Native American tepi becomes warm and snug in winter and cool and dry in summer. A fire built in the center draws properly and do no longer condenses inside. There's no draft, no dampness and no more dirt in the living area than in the average summer cottage. A liner, in other words, almost magically transforms the tepi from a tent into a home. 15 identical tapered panels each 6 feet long, 34 1-4 inches wide at the top and 48 3-4 inches across the bottom will be needed to make your liner. The panels can be made from any lightweight material but it is more important that the finished liner be waterproof than that the teepee cover itself be so treated. If you can't obtain the muslin or other fabric in a 72-inch width, 36-inch material sewed together with a flat seam will work quite well. Cut the panels reversing every other one to save material, seam them together and hem the top and bottom of the liner. If you rough cut all 15 sections 34 1 2 to 35 inches across the top and 48 1 2 to 49 inches at the bottom, the finished liner should go completely around the inside and lap generously, depending upon how the poles are placed, how tightly the liner is tied, etc. A double 3 16 inch cord and reinforcing patch added across or tie tape sewed into the top and bottom of each vertical seam will complete the liner. If you use cord for these ties, it can also be fastened to the fabric in the traditional string around a pebble manner for attaching peg loops. Make each free end of the ties 24 to 30 inches long. Note that the lower set of cords is located 6 to 8 inches from the liner's bottom edge and the last bottom tie is set in from the outside vertical edge. This allows the bottom of the liner to be turned in all the way around and the meeting ends to lap. You'll find it easier to locate that last tie on. A double 3 16 inch cord and reinforcing patch added across or tie tape sewed into the top and bottom of each vertical seam will complete the liner. If you use cord for these ties, it can also be fastened to the fabric in the traditional string around a pebble manner shown for attaching peg loops. Make each free end of the ties 24 to 30 inches long. Note that the lower set of cords is located 6 to 8 inches from the liner's bottom edge and the last bottom tie is set in from the outside vertical edge. This allows the bottom of the liner to be turned in all the way around and the meeting ends to lap. You'll find it easier to locate that last tie after the liner is hung for the first time. Some tepi owners prefer to tie the liner directly to the poles but if you do, remember to insert two little twigs under each tie on the inside of the supports. This allows stray trickles running down the support to keep right on going instead of dripping off at the tie point. How to pitch the tepi. Look for a well-drained, smooth, level area and remove all roots, stones, etc. Although a tepi can be comfortable in the broiling sun, you can pitch yours to the northeast of a tree or trees in the summer for late morning to evening shade, if you wish. Don't locate directly under trees because they can be dangerous during storms and drip for hours after a rain. The floor plan of a properly pitched tepi is oval or egg-shaped, rather than round. The tepi cone is also tilted and steeper up the back than the front. This is a main secret of the tent's comfort. If the tepi were an evenly balanced cone, the smoke vent would center around the poles where they cross and would be too large to close completely during a rain. 
By changing the floor plan and tilting the cone, the Native Americans were able to extend the smoke hole down the elongated front of the tent. This placed the crossing of the poles at the top of the smoke hole instead of in the middle and allowed the opening to be easily closed with the protruding flaps. It also moves the fire slightly toward the front of the teepee, which makes more efficient use of the tent's interior. Pick out the four heaviest poles. Three will be used for the foundation tripod and the fourth will be the lifting pole. Spread out the tepi cover and use it to measure the tripod poles. Note that, since the finished cover is not a true half circle, this method automatically and correctly locates the tripod tie point lower on poles. Good tepi poles are sharpened on each end. If you intend to plant the butts of the tripod poles a few inches in the ground, allow for that right now and mark the three supports where they cross so you won't have to remeasure every time you erect the tent. Using one end of a 45-foot length of one 2-inch rope, tie the three poles with a clove hitch as illustrated, wrap the rope around the poles three or four times and finish with two half hitches. Put the butts of poles where they'll be in the pitched tepi and, while someone holds taut the loose end of the 1-2 inch rope, raise the tripod by walking up under. When the poles are almost vertical, swing the butt across to its approximate final position. This locks the tripod and gives it a twisted dog chasing its tail appearance where the poles cross and are tied. As nearly as possible, position the poles exactly as they'll be when the tent is completely pitched. The 212 foot by 212 foot grid on one floor plan will help. Note that this tepi measures 20 feet from front to back and 1712 feet across. Notice also that the tepi's pole pattern is shifted just slightly off square around the perimeter clockwise. Set the next 11 poles into place exactly in the order 1, 2, 3 and 4 from the right, or north, side go into the front crotch first 5, 6, 7 and 8 then stack into the front crotch from the left, or south, side and 9, 10 and 11 are put into the back crotch last. Again, strictly follow this order and be sure to skip a place on the perimeter at L, for the lifting pole. At this point, carry the 1-2 inch rope outside the frame at pole S and wrap it clockwise 4 times around the standing poles. Snap the rope tightly up into the area where the poles cross and bring it in over. Angle a 2 by 2 peg 3 feet long into the tepi floor slightly behind center and snug the rope under it. It helps if the peg has a knob on top. Lay the lifting pole down the center of the cover and mark it at the tip of the tie flap. Put the pole aside and fold the outside edges of the cover into the center so that the lacing pin holes meet down the center line. Fold and refold both halves of the cover on themselves until each is a long triangle 2 feet wide at the base. Fold the two triangles together. Put the lifting pole alongside the canvas, butt to the base of the bundle, and securely tie the tapes to the pole where previously marked. Hoist the pole and canvas, set the pole's butt into position and drop it into the last space in the rear crotch. Turn the pole as you lift it and let it fall so that the cover is always on top. If the cover fits too high or too low where the poles cross, swing the lifting pole back down and relocate the tie flap tapes. Unroll the cover around each side of the frame to the front. Tie a pole the one you'll later set in front of the teepee door across supports D and F1 to stand on while you tie the smoke hole base tapes together and insert the top lacing pins. The cover should be slack enough to allow you to lap the south left over the north right side. Remove the crossbar as you button down the front of the teepee. Insert the poles in the upside down smoke flap pockets. Cut these poles just long enough to stretch the flaps tight when their butts cross or barely touch close against the back center line of the tent. Round the pole tips to protect the flap pockets. Loosen the smoke flap poles so they just help hold the cover even and begin pushing the frame poles out against the cover. Do not push the poles out tightly until the cover is properly pegged down, but do space them out evenly to aid in locating the pegs. By the way, as soon as you're sure the tripod is placed correctly, set the three poles with a shovel, if you intend to set them. The peg loops are three 16-inch cord tied in a square knot around a 3-4-inch pebble 6 inches above the cover's lower edge. 
Tie the loose ends of the cord into another square knot, insert and twirl a peg to twist the cord tightly into a no-slip grip. Peg down the front, then the rear and both sides of the cover. Use a sledge and long iron rod to make lead holes for the pegs in hard or rocky soil. Now push the poles tightly out against the cover. For a permanent camp, plant all the teepee poles by loosening a few pegs, digging under a pole, twisting it into the ground, replacing the pegs and moving on around the circle. If you find the door pole is too long, as sometimes happens the first time a teepee is raised, plant it deeper or chop it off. If you chop it off, of course, it will cause no trouble next time. Spacing the poles for the first time is the hardest part of pitching a tepee. Once you get them right, swing a cord off the center peg and measure the distance out to each one. Write the figures down and use them the next time you erect the tent. You'll also find that smoke from fires in the tepee will darken the cover everywhere but directly behind each pole and you'll soon be able to line up the supports with the white stripes on the canvas. Once you've got them, retie the anchor rope. Set a six or eight foot pole in front of the door to tie the smoke flap cords to and your teepee is up. The door itself a piece of canvas laced over a willow rod frame is hung from the last lacing pin over the doorway. Once the lining is hung inside and its bottom six inches turned in all around, robes, a waterproof tarp, oilcloth, burlap, old linoleum or a plywood floor can be put down inside and lapped over the liner's edge. Waterproof layers are really only needed under the beds and other items affected by dampness. Ditch around the tepee to lead water away, make a couple of willow rod backrests, hollow out and line a fireplace circle with rocks and you're ready to dedicate your lodge. If you want to make sure the fire draws exceptionally well, you might dig a trench, remove the tops and bottoms from some tin cans and bury them in line to make a vent pipe leading from outside the teepee to the bottom of the fire pit. So, hang your shield and other medicine articles from a pole behind the altar of your lodge and move in. Forget storm windows, leaky faucets, plugged eave troughs, water in the basement, sticking doors, cracked sinks, missing shingles, compound interest and 40-year mortgages. Thanks for watching this how-to video. You most likely noticed the accent and spelling of the word, tepi. Depending on where you are from the spelling can change from tepi, tepi or tepi. Although all are correct, we chose to use, tepi, due to our upbringing. Please keep in mind that the instructions provided can be modified to fit your own designs. Be sure to study and watch more videos to get a better grasp on how to make a tepi to fit your surroundings. All information in this video was gathered from social media sources. We encourage everyone to study several different methods before starting your tepi build. Thanks for watching.